Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Can somebody just shout out, praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Can we all lift our hands? Can we put our hands together, maybe be better? Make a little noise, a little racket. Let everybody know we're in the house. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Why don't you just turn to somebody right now around you and shake their hand and smile at them and tell them, hey, it's great to be in God's house. So good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. Give our coffee crew a few minutes to get inside and get woke up. And if you didn't get what you needed this morning, it's so good to be back in Louisiana. It's good to be here this morning. Good to be here with you. Can we give all of our guests a round of applause if you are a guest here today? We appreciate you being with us. Thank you so very much. Amen. My family and I, my wife, my son and my daughter, not my entire family, but returned from vacation, I think late Wednesday night. Been gone for about 10 days. Uh, we had a fantastic time. To give you a brief synopsis, we went to the lake in Missouri. We went to the river rafting in Tennessee. We went to the ark in Kentucky. We went to the movies in Indiana. We went to the zoo in Ohio. What else? We drove a lot. We looked a lot. We ate a lot. We laughed a lot. We argued a little. I mean, we was in the truck a lot. It was close proximity. But something interesting happened. Several interesting things happened, and maybe you'll hear about some of them later. But one thing I wanted to share with you this morning, we went to the zoo in Cincinnati. I didn't know it, but it's the second oldest zoo in the United States of America. And, and while we were there, we, I think, saw everything in the zoo. Amen. We spent hours and hours at the zoo. But, but I want to show you a picture of something. Uh, that, that might be hard for you to see, but there's a lioness sleeping on a rock. I, I like going to the zoo about once every 20 years. I think that's the first time I've been to the zoo since, since Gentry's been born. Maybe never with Sierra. And when I go to the zoo, I like looking at the big cats. I don't care too much about seeing the, you know, the, the sloths. They're just not that interesting. You just kind of hang there. And, and then there's the insects and the snakes and alligators and squirrels and chipmunks. And, you know, they're all running around the grass. And, and I'm standing there looking at the lioness, and my wife is there with me. And I think Jitra and Sarah are in close proximity. And I, I hear a lot of... One little boy, about, about five years old, said, hey, lion. And she just done her head like that and backed down. And, oh, he got all excited, you know, and clapped, screamed, and cheered. And, and then there was a loud commotion behind me. And, and I turned and looked, and just across the little cobblestone pathway that I was walking on was this grass thatch roofed hut. And a zookeeper lady had walked out from somewhere, and she had a big, long snake draped across her her neck, and, and, and the kids that were there on a field trip, about 30 or 40 of them, just flocked to her. People coming around a, a corner there from this other enclosure saw her. And, and just, man, everybody just went to see the snake and was petting it and, and looking at it and ooing and aahing. And, and, and me and Candace is just standing there staring at the lioness. And, and I thought, they're more interested in seeing a stupid snake then they are looking at a sleeping lioness. I, I would rather look at the lioness than at the serpent. And, and, and then all of a sudden, and I wish I had been video, and if I knew what was going to happen next, I, of course, would have been video. And isn't that the way that it always is? I, I didn't know what was going to happen next, but this is what happened next. Listen. <laughs> 
He just walks out from some hidden spot in the bamboo. And all of a sudden, it is standing room only where I'm at. My wife and I are jostled and jammed up against the fence, and, and they're screaming, and kids running, and people watching, and, and ooh and, and ah, and, and I, I kind of look back like this, and there's one lone figure standing under that grass-thatched roof. And it's the lady with the serpent. And everybody else, and people are coming around the corner and running from, this is, and my wife said, oh, it's the king of the jungle. And, and, and I said, when the king shows up, baby, Come on. he always draws the crowd. And, and, and she said, you're already working on a sermon. I said, you better know it. If you want to draw a crowd, get the king in the house. If you want to draw the crowd, get the king roaring. Activate whatever you got to do. Come on, somebody. You know what he told me? He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. He said, if two or three of you get together and worship, I am going to inhabit the praises of my people. I will be there in the midst of them also. Come on, anybody else want to help me get the king in the house this morning? I don't know about you, but I want the line of the tribe of Judah, the king of kings and the Lord of glory. It's not about the piano. It's not about the guitar. It's not about your pretty suit or your pretty set of clothing. It's not about what we left out in the parking lot. It's not about the carpet or the seats. It's about the king and the visitation from God on high. If we get him in the house today, everything else is going to be all right. I don't care what kind of load you're under. I don't care what kind of burden you're bearing. I don't care what kind of foe that you have been opposing. I want you to understand this morning, if you get him on your side, I said if you get him on your side, if you can get him activated, amen, you just, you just, and, and just like that scene there, just you, you know, you may not see him, you may not know he's there, we didn't know he was even around, and all of a sudden he just walks out and says, Ugh. Ugh. And, and, and I looked at him and I thought, you know, they, they say he roar, he's roaring, but when I roar, he roar. It takes some effort. Dylan, all he was doing was breathing hard with his mouth open. Right. Uh, uh. Watch it. Something. Look it up on YouTube. Watch it. Uh. I thought, man, all he's got to do is breathe hard. Scares everything on the Serengeti half to death because he's walking around breathing. My wife fusses at me because he's got to where I grunt a lot. Is that an age-associated thing? You know, she tells me when I'm sitting down, I'm grunt. <clears throat> when I stand up, <clears throat> put my shoes on, <clears throat> she does something I don't like. <clears throat> one of the kids gets in an argument with the other one. <clears throat> they notice when I start grunting, that might be a good thing. All you got to do is get him to just breathe a little bit. I read in Scripture where it said he breathed on them and they received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Just one breath is just... We're talking about needing a touch and needing a word. Really, all you need is some breathing. Just, just him breathe on you the breath of life this morning. Amen. Well, I'm going to get out of the way. Anybody ready to worship the Lord? Put your hands together. That sounds awesome. Let him know that we're in the house and we're lifting him up today. It's all about him. God bless you. Worship with him as they sing. This world is not my home.
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. I, I, I read the news uh, almost on a daily basis, at least the headlines, and, and uh, I get aggravated on a daily basis, at, at, you know, mostly at the headlines. Amen. And, uh, and, and the truth is, is what this song says. I just can't feel at home in this world anymore. I, 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 I want to say there's a left and a right. And, and then that would mean that there's a middle and, and there's the progressives and there's what we call the woke and there's the council culture and, and there's the conservatives and there's the Republicans and there's the Democrats. And, but the truth is, I can't find anybody, I should say hardly anybody, that I wholeheartedly can just get on board with and agree with. And, and, and the reason is because I, I just don't fit. This, this world just is not really my home. It's, it's where I'm at right now. Come on, somebody. I, 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 look, I, I just got off a of vacation, and, and uh, you know that. We stayed at a bed and breakfast with this wonderful couple uh, that I would not want to live with more than a day or two. They had a gorgeous house, beautiful place, but I wouldn't want to stay there more than just a couple of days because the truth is it wasn't my home. There's, there's a George Jones song, and, uh, and, and my wife, when I played it while we were on vacation, she said it's so depressing and so, so just, just heart-rending. And, and, but the song says, I want to go home. Baby, are you enjoying the vacation? I want to go home. I want to go home. Oh, oh me, I... Did you enjoy the lake? I want to go home. Didn't you, didn't you love the zoo? I want to go home. But the ark encounter in Kentucky, oh, it was fantastic. But, but Kevin, when I walked off, I was thinking, I want to go home. I like my recliner, my TV, my grill, my kitchen, my refrigerator, my house, my yard, my we got water in our pool in the backyard. It's just don't need the lake, you know. I like my church. Amen. Hey, hey let me tell you something about, about what my family thinks about this church. We were, we were, I guess, in Cincinnati. I don't remember where it was at. And, and got in the truck, and my kids said, where are we headed? I said, well, we're eating breakfast, and we headed to Del High. And, and I had the GPS pulled up on the screen, and it said 576 miles, I think is what it was. And said, your arrival time is going to be like 6.51 p.m. And Sierra says, so if we really try, we can make it home in time for church. Just 11 hours and however many. I, I said, baby, you're going to have to TT at least 14 times. Add to that for your mama. And we got to stop for gas, and you're going to want a snack. I, oh, we, we're not going to make it, baby. I just, but she was so excited at the prospect. It's, we were ready to come back to church because we love you, but we really love being in his presence with you. Amen. Did I say that right? Hey, we love you, but we really love being in his presence with you. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm not preaching this morning, so I'm taking a little extra time, I guess. But, but our praise singers are ready to carry us to the throne of God if you'll worship with them. Are you going to worship with them? If you'll worship with them and not just listen to them, come on, you'll have an encounter, come on, an right. interaction. You'll, you'll, you'll feel differently than you do just standing there listening if you'll kind of worship with them as we magnify and glorify the great King of glory. Somebody shout Hallelujah. Why don't you just lift your hands one more time. God, we gather here today to give you praise and glory and honor. We want to lift you up, Lord. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Worship with them.
and it was Calvary that happened where we didn't have to stop at the outer courts and we didn't have to stop at the holy place that we can come into the holiest of holies for there's miraculous provision and uh, miraculous word and authority worship with us
hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Holy, holy, holy. I love you, Lord Jesus. Come on. Let's just keep lifting him up a little bit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your presence in the house this morning. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for visiting us today. I love and magnify you, Lord. I worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise your name, Jesus. I don't know about you, I don't know about you but a few minutes ago, I just kind of felt something come into the building. I, I don't know if you felt it, but while lifting him up, while they're singing and they're anointed and I'm lifting my hands and praising and magnifying and just kind of singing along, holy, holy, holy is your name. Hallelujah. I feel it right now. Why don't you just lift your hands all across the sanctuary? Somebody say it with me. Holy, holy, holy is your name. Say it like you mean it. You'd be surprised what you feel. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You know, when you get to heaven, there'll be angels around the throne night and day. Just holy, holy, holy is the Lord God omnipotent who reigneth forever and ever. He likes it. He loves it when we just say holy. Come on, that's it. Why don't you just close your eyes right now and just feel after the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. There's no telling what can happen here in the next few moments. the King of Kings. You are my everything. You, oh God, are my everything. Come on, just adore him right now. Just adore him right now. Oh, he's holy. He is the Son God Almighty. You better believe he's coming back. You better believe he's coming back. Hallelujah. That's it. Come on, just sing it out to him. Of kings. You are my everything. Say it like you mean it. You are my everything. Oh, I adore you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Yield to him right now. I wish, I wish somebody would go ahead and receive your healing right now. I wish somebody receive your blessing right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Pour out your spirit upon us right now, Lord. Pour out your spirit upon us right now, Lord. presence right now. Your will, not mine, be done, Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let his presence wash over you. Let his presence just wash over you right now. Hallelujah. Let him give you what you need right now. Let him give you that healing. Let him give you that deliverance. Let him fill you with his spirit right now. It can happen right where you're standing. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
to just love it on him a little bit and it's all you need. You may find that just adoring him from the bottom of your heart, just a little bit is all that you need. You may find just giving him praise, glory and honor is enough for him to have an audience with you this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Healing in Jesus' name. Deliverance in Jesus' name. Salvation in Jesus' name. A breakthrough in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for letting us find direction today. Thank you, Almighty God, for meeting needs this morning. Thank you, God, for healing this morning, for delivering this morning, Lord. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody like what you feel? Hallelujah, hallelujah. That's not music that you feel. That's not just emotion that you feel. That's the King of Kings. That's the Lord of glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for making your presence known to us in this service this morning. Well, Brother Lester, I don't feel anything. Well, it's something wrong with your feeler. Amen. There's something wrong with, there's nothing wrong with him. It's just, amen. It's maybe, you, maybe you need to be a little more sensitive or a little more focused. Or, you know, you know it's, 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 it's funny to me, but even in the midst of of trying to focus and keep my mind on him there's always these mental distractions but but I have a lot of control over that like I can decide sometimes what I want to think about and what I don't want I can't always I can't always decide when a thought just comes screaming across my brain but I can decide whether or not I want to entertain it and 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 so when I'm trying to magnify and worship I can think about lunch later, ball game, golf, job, or, or I could say, you know what, it, it, it's 1038, I got time. That's right, Brother Dave, this, this is his time. And I'm going to just magnify him a little bit and lift him up a little bit. I, I came to church today to have service. Not just a social gathering, but service to the king service to my brothers and sisters you know you know the police have this slogan to serve and protect and and, and they get blasted a lot of times when they don't deserve it for not serving or not protecting but but when i read the articles Sometimes I think, why should they have to hazard their life because of your sheer stupidity? I mean, somebody jumps in a lake and starts swimming out. And you're standing there saying, don't go out there. Come back. Don't swim too far. I'm standing here in full body armor with a lot of extra weight. I haven't been trained in water rescue. I'm not coming to get you. And, and then when they sink, they want to blame it on. It, I, I find people do the same thing with God, really. Oh, God. I didn't get you. We're whitewater rafting on the Okoye River. And, and you can literally see how it declines. And the guide says, you see how the mountains are getting closer together? He said, watch, watch the mountain. You always can tell when it's fixing to be really rough and really. And I'm holding on to the paddle, and I got Sierra right behind me and Gentry beside me and Candace in the back. And, 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 I, and I just kind of uttered a prayer real quick. I said, oh, Lord, be with us. And, and immediately the thought popped in my mind said, look, I didn't put you on that raft. I thought, Lord, what a fine time to tell me something like that. And then my next thought was, look, you better be paying attention to the guide then. And when he says paddle on the left, you paddle on the left. And when he says backstroke on the right, you better be just. You 
sometimes we get ourselves into situations and we want to blame God. God, why do you? No, I didn't put you in that situation. Get me out of it then. <laughs> you better find some help. Come on, am I the only one that ever has those kind of experiences? What happens is we don't start off with God, trusting God, following God. And if you don't, if you don't do that, you're going to wind up somewhere you don't want to be. And, and, and so this morning, what I'm saying about the worship is if you focus on him and, and not allow your brain to go off in all these other tangents, you may find that while you're focusing on him, your need is met and you may not have even realized it. What, what do you mean? I mean, you may walk out of here and, and, and then realize, you know what? That pain is gone. You, you know what? I, I'm not as depressed as I was. Man, just, you know when you get depressed, you feel a weight pressing you down. And when the depression leaves, you feel lighter. It, maybe you've never been depressed. You can't relate to what I'm talking about. Maybe you've been, never been stressed or worried or anxious. But, but when it breaks, you know it. Amen? Brother Dan Stansberry is my very dear and best friend, father of my son-in-law. One day he'll be a rival grandparent, if the Lord will it. I had him scheduled to preach this morning, and just because I made it back, I didn't want to be one of those kind of guys that's like, well, I'm here now, you know, you get it. You know. I've been praying and seeking the Lord, and I believe that God's got something on Brother Dan's heart for us this morning, and I'm inviting him to come. He's done a fantastic job. Well, I haven't been here. Done an awesome job on the Family Life Center, and uh, I heard this morning that very possibly we may get our final inspection tomorrow morning. And, and so if we do that, then did you say yes? If, if we do that, that means that we'll be full-blown, ready to go for Shore Up the Core, which is next month. Look at your calendar. Look at your bulletin. Look at the calendar online. Got a lot of great things coming up. But right now, we're still having church. Can you say praise God? Why don't you give the Lord a hand clap of praise while Brother Dan comes. God bless you, brother. Amen, amen, amen. Just lift up Jesus. He's so good to us. Just keep lifting him up. Magnify him for a second longer. Has it been good to you this week? Mighty God, mighty God, glory to God, praise God. Thank you so much for uh, your worship today. It's so good to see uh, old friends, new friends, Amen. new people here this morning, um, folks that are hanging out with us now. We appreciate you coming and hanging out with us Amen. and just worshiping with us, and we appreciate you uh, joining with us here uh, uh, today, and um, we welcome you back. Every time the doors are open, even if the doors are not open, if you want to come by. But we're just so glad to have all of you this morning in uh, service. I'm sure that's already been said. And, um, I mean, you guys, you just heard three mini messages up here. Uh, you can tell what's going on. But So if you're ADHD and you have a hard time focusing, well, you, you know what? This was like your, your popsicle today. I mean, he just gave you three messages like in a row. Like, surely one of them hit somebody somewhere along the way. And it's going to keep your focus. I, I probably won't preach three messages while I'm staying in here this morning. But, but hopefully uh, you're plugged in today. And I to, uh, uh, to be careful, you know, we've, sometimes when you enter a service, sometimes you feel things that are sort of delaying or obstructing or distracting or kind of hindering. But... But I don't feel that now, and uh, I feel like this, the presence of God is, has just filtered into this place and touched people, and, and we, we need to do that, obviously, before the Word is, is delivered, because God opens our heart up, and he helps, sometimes He helps a hardened heart receive uh, the Word that it needs. Sometimes it's, it's a lot easier to receive when the Lord opens our spirit up, and we're, we're on the same page with Him this morning, so... Uh, I was just really trying to take the, the temperature in this place while I go. The Spirit of the Lord was moving, and I, I didn't feel any kind of desire to back away with, from because because I'm one of them kind of guys, if God wants to move, I'm going to get out of his way. But, but I think the Lord was just opening hearts. 
in this place. And uh, just so, so this morning, the, the, the words that you hear uh, today probably aren't going to be filled with a lot of humor uh, as a means to keep your attention, uh, to, to defeating the tendencies of a, of a wandering mind in case you're bored today. I, 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 I'm not, probably not going to make a lot of jokes about what I have to say about and, and I don't try to make jokes anyway. Sometimes they just come out. But, so, so I ask you just to hear me today. And uh, I, 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 that's, that's kind of my opening plea. Just hear me out so that you, 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 you will not receive just sound bites of what I'm trying to say. But tune in to what I'm, I'm trying to, to give you so that you'll receive the, the essence of, of what you need to take away from what I have to speak about this morning. Because this is something that is very important to me right now. And something that has been on my heart for quite some time that I have held in my, in my, inside and just allowed to marinate in my own life before I even uttered a word to anybody else. Just for weeks and weeks I've had this inside of me and I've saved it for today. I feel like today is the day that I need to, to, to give this what I feel like God has just given to me. And, uh, and, and so just, just, just know that, uh, that this is not something that I got in five minutes this morning, just just bear with me. Not that God can't do that too, but 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 just you all guys, we we've been talking about this so much. We were entered into a season that that has the strong potential of of putting our faith and everything that we stand for on the line. This the season we're in right now, uh, we, we're just uh, it, it's it, it has the potential of of bringing us to the line. And, and, and bringing us into uh, a position to where we have to stand up for what is right and what we believe for our faith. Because there are forces uh, of the Antichrist that are already at work in this world right now that are they're changing and, and terraforming the spiritual landscape that the church has relaxed in for so long. Right now, it's it's you know, and I know that that, that we we live in a really laid back country right now. It's still it's it's still not even close to what some deal with around the world. But but if we live long enough, and and if we're not vaporized as a nation sooner more than later, there's a war that's coming. According to the word of God, out of the the prophetic book of Daniel. This world leader that is on the brink of emerging from hell's laboratory is going to make a war against the saints of God. And and, and Daniel 7 and 25 tells us that he shall speak pompous words against the Most High. It says he shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time time, and times and half a time, which is three and a half years. This is what the Word tells us. So in case you haven't noticed, the Antichrist or or Satan doesn't like anything that the church stands for. He doesn't like anything that we stand for. In case you hadn't noticed it lately, everything that we believe and hold fast to, and and it's being thrown in our face. And I I really like what he said back in the prayer room. He said, we have to be careful. See, I, I take things w- w- one way. You may, t- but he said, we got to be careful that we're inclusive, and we're not preaching the doctrine of inclusion here. But we have to be careful that we allow anyone to come here to find grace and redemption and forgiveness and and the righteousness of God. We have to allow those people to come here. But at the same time, when I hear him say that, he's just giving us a warning because you know why? Because we're going to be looking at some of these people before long. They're going to come in here all messed up. And, and those, those, so we have to be careful because we're going to be put to the test. We're, our, what we stand for is going to be put to the test. And if we're not careful, it, it, uh, we'll back down. We'll, 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 we'll recede and recline and pull back. He doesn't stand for anything that we stand for. And, and, and as, you, as, as these opposing views begin to, uh, to, to, to go on longer and as they begin to simmer, the, the, this wrestle we have as they begin to push these things uh, towards the people of God, because that's who they're pushing them towards. Yeah. There, there's, there's a lot of tension is going to grow, and, and turbulent times are going to be just around the corner because of this. You see, we believe in preserving life. Satan wants to abort it. And, and we believe in preserving marriages. Satan wants to destroy them. And we believe that God created us in a manner that identifies us as a male and a female and, 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 and a human. We don't purr or bark. I don't know if you, oh my goodness. 
Why should we have to have this discussion? I, I, you're not a cat or a dog. You can't identify as that. We shouldn't be having to have had this discussion. Yes, they're doing that in class now. They're, they're, they're identifying themselves as a transgender cat. So when they speak to them, they meow. And the teachers aren't allowed to say anything to them. We, we, y'all, this world is really messed up right now. I didn't see things like this when I was a kid. I mean, my goodness. Things are not right. And they're not in our favor. And they're not moving towards us. Satan says that, you know, that, you know he, he, he wants to destroy everything that we believe in. And, and so that, you know, you know we believe that, that we're all created with the same rights as humans and believe that we should dwell together peacefully. You know, but the devil has, has worked to establish secular minority hate groups. And he uses these groups to create division and hate. And, 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 and that this is, we see this going on all the time. That you know, he wants to see, uh, you know, he wants to see all of us in bondage where, where we want to people to experience liberty and freedom like they've never had before. This is his agenda. There's no need to really go any further, but, but there is a reason that the Antichrist will war against us, and that's because we stand for everything that Satan doesn't. And it's no surprise that John said for this purpose, Christ was manifested so that he could destroy the works of the devil. And, and in the end, God's chosen people will be the only force that stands between the devil and his agenda. And according to the prophetic words of Revelation 20, 12 and 12, which says, Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury. It says, because he knows that his time is short. Look at somebody say, he knows. The devil knows. So what does it tell me when the devil knows? It tells me that he believes what the Bible says. He believes it. What's wrong with us? He knows his time is short. I mean, what's wrong? With, he knows he don't have very long. He's got his plan going hard at it. He doesn't have a problem getting off of it and moving forward. I'm pushing forward. You know, I don't have a lot of time, so i got to make it happen. So with everything that he's got in him right now, because he knows. He knows God doesn't lie. He knows that the word of the God is truth. He knows it. He knows it for, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. The devil knows that God's not a liar and what he says comes to pass. So if Satan has observed that his time is short, and he believes a prophetic word, he knows that he has only been given a season and then his time will be over. And so what I find interesting is this, in this whole thing is since he already knows that he's ultimately going to fail, why does he keep pursuing after it anyway? That doesn't make any sense to my mind. It, it, it's as if he is chasing after or pursuing a loss. He's literally chasing defeat, so why bother? Satan knows what the Word of God says. He knows uh, what his ending is going to be. And you better know that, that he believes, that, that believes in God, and he's become very familiar with his plans in the future. So, so the intelligent mind would read this prophecy that tells us that the devil's time is short and understand immediately that it would be pointless to push an opposing agenda that fights against God because it's a guaranteed loss. So this, this would be worse than that a high school football team wanting to go out and play in the current Super Bowl champions. You, you know you're walking into defeat. There's no doubt you're going to get mowed down and run over. So why does Satan, being the cunning, sly old fox that he is, bother to enter into a war that prophesies his utter defeat? There's one factor that overrides his intellect. Fury. Or anger. Or great wrath, the Bible says. He's, he's full of wrath. It says he's full of wrath. He's full of fury. And his time is short. Fury over. See, I know this, just evaluating this, sort of say, I realize that, that when I'm filled with fury or just filled with wrath, I don't make the best decisions. The Bible says he's filled with fury. He hates people so much especially the people of God. And he'll be so angry because he doesn't have much time left to steal, kill, and destroy humanity. And so out of blind fury, he will set out to steal, kill, and destroy. But the Bible says the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. That's what, that's what I read out. So, so while he's stealing, killing, and destroying, we're going to be healing and delivering. He, he will be undoing what, we're going to undo everything that he does. 
And that, that's the reason why he has to get rid of us. We're in the way. And, and so, see, where his sin abounds, grace abounds much more. It, you know, it don't matter what he throws at the church. It doesn't matter what he throws at the body of Christ. It doesn't matter what he throws at us. We have the solution, the remedy. We have the answer, and it's Jesus. We have it here. We are a problem to him because everything that he's trying to do goes against us, and we stop him on the inside. It may not look like it on the media. It may not look like it in the, in the circuitry that you look at, but in the world, in the real picture, everything that he throws at the church, every problem he throws at people, the church can fix it. We have the solution. We are a problem to him. It was for this purpose that Jesus was manifested. He came to destroy the works of the devil, and we are Jesus' body now. So we've taken on his mantle to destroy the works of the devil. And so the only chance that the Antichrist will have in promoting his agenda is to rid the world of God's people. He's got to get rid of us. In the full circle of things, it's easy to see that Satan's agenda was, has it changed from the very beginning. We must understand that Satan's top priority has always been to kill Jesus. Always. And, and it's still the same, only now the body of Christ has spread all over the earth. He's always wanted to kill Jesus from day one. He tried, to, he tried to exterminate him through many different means, means from, from, from killing the firstborn male. Just all, finally, he, he got him at the cross. Well, you know, the body of Christ has changed shape now. It's, in, it's, in the, it's, it's made up of lots of people. And so he still has the agenda to kill, steal, and destroy God's people. It hasn't changed any. Daniel 12 and 7 tells us that this war that he will make against the people of God will go on for a time, times, and half time. It says, until the power of the holy people has finally been broken. And then it says, all these things will be completed. So war is coming. The Antichrist, it says he's going to make war with the saints. He's going to pick the fight, and, and, and that's what fierce anger causes. The only way his agenda can move forward on the earth during this short period is if we, the people of God, have been extinguished. I have a strong feeling that there will be people who belong to the kingdom of God that will have to endure different measures, sometimes great measures of persecution. Revelations 2 and 10 gives us a clue as to how we should conduct ourselves when a time like this arises. It says, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days, it says, this is what he says. This is his prescription. It says, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. This was his answer. The Bible says that they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the water of testimony. It says, not loving their lives so much that they feared dying for what they believed. So when we look back in history, and even uh, look into what is happening today in other countries, we see that where the followers of Christ They've had to lay down their lives to serve the Lord at some point. All over the world, there are people that actually have to lay down their lives. It's not like America everywhere else, y'all. In fact, most places are not like America. There's a lot more persecution probably in the world than there's not. So in those places like that, and even maybe here at some point, there had to be someone who stood up among them and explained That there could come a day that you may have to live in a very inconvenient manner. Or you may have to endure persecution. Or possibly even have to die for what you believe. And would you be willing to? I had a a discussion like this with my wife the other day. And uh, and I've also had a similar discussion with my kids and my daughter-in-laws a while back. They probably think I'm just morbid. But... I'm not sure how you guys think of me, you know, you know, and I really don't care. You can th- think bad of me if you want to, that's fine. But, but because to me, the kingdom of God and, and the assembly of the body of Christ is not some sort of high moral social club where we put on a weekly performance of clean entertainment. Uh, it, its purpose is to save people from the eternal punishment that we deserve by way of the payment that Jesus made, which was purchase, purchasing our sin and then gave us the Holy Ghost so that we could be sons of God and join heirs with Christ to a kingdom not made with man's hands. That's, that's what I believe in. This is a life or death thing to me. It's everything to me. It's all or nothing. And I, I believe I, that's the only way I can do anything. It's hard for me to do anything halfway. 
It's an all or nothing type deal. You're either all in or you're not in at all. He's either Lord of all or not Lord at all. It's, it's, it's all the, that's the only way it works. There's no in between. And there's no fence riding in this. You either belong to his kingdom or you don't belong to it. You're either a citizen of heaven or you're not a citizen. I believe in eternal life and I fully embrace salvation. This salvation. This so great salvation, like the Bible says, was extended to me. And I realized that it, that it is saving me from a side of eternity that I don't want to be a part of. I, I know what the Word of God says about the last days. You know what the Word of God says about the, about the last days. In essence, you know what it says. I could see these times getting closer. And, and if there was ever a time that I need to ask these hard questions to my family, it's now. Not later. It's right now. You need to talk about things like this right now with your family. Not some other time. Not when times get bad. Not when you really don't know what to do. You need to think about things like this right now because you can see them coming. When you see something coming, you don't wait till it gets on top of you to start talking about it. I know good and well most of you guys, when you go on a, a great big vacation, you don't plan it the night before. You know it's coming, that time whenever you decide to have it, you start planning, making plans and preparations. We do our lives like this. We don't want to wait till this thing is on top of us before we, before we have these kind of discussions with our families. Before things change, I mean change like it is for a lot of the world is now. My wife shared something to me with me the other day that I could really relate to. This is a... Uh, a comment that a parent made, I guess it was on social media of some kind, it says, my job as a parent is not to get you into Harvard. My job is to get you into heaven. I'm thinking, man, there's a lot of parents that need to say that nowadays to their kids. They poured their entire life in their future and their education, and they've spent about 50 cents on their, on their eternity. I'm not going to go into that. That's thinking about that aggravates me. Because if you really care about your kids, you're going to make sure they can make it to heaven. If you really care about your family, if you really care about them, you, you, that education is, falls a far second compared to their relationship with Jesus Christ and their eternal destination. If you don't know where your wife is going and your children are going, if you have no idea, you're not sure, you need to be talking to them about it now. My God, forgive me. I don't want to... Those things like that just anger me. Those are discussions and talks we have to have with our, our families. As responsible men and women and parents, we have the responsibility to prepare our families for what we see coming. Even if it doesn't look anything like Disney World Christianity that so much of the United States participates in. I realize that a, a conversation of this kind may not promote warm, fuzzy, happy feelings. If, you know, if you start talking about this to your family, you know, and, and men, you may not score a lot of points and put a lot of points, uh, uh, money in the love bank with your wife talking about these kind of things. I realize that. But, but I mean, our, our job as priest and prophet of the household it was never again to be, to be fun and games all the time and jokes. Sometimes you have to talk about serious stuff and take care of business. I mean, while everyone is still in their right mind and while no one is in the middle of a meltdown, th this conversation needs to happen in every American home among those who call themselves followers of Christ. That's all it is to it. I mean, I mean you need to discuss the what ifs and commit to a response that will honor the Lord ahead of time. Commit to something verbally and vocally in front of your family and say, I won't back down. Uh, you, you mark my words. It will help you be accountable when times get bad because your children are watching everything you do. They're watching your casual relationship with God, Dad. They are. Your kids are watching your laid-back relationship with Jesus. They're watching it. Dad, don't care. I don't either. I don't know that it might not hurt some of our children to feel the flames of hell just a little bit every once in a while. Just to remind them that it's real. I want mine to make it to heaven. It's my job. If I can't save anybody else, and if I can't even save my family, this is a waste. I may as well quit today and just go live it up and have pleasures in this world if we can't save our families. Now is the time to make an open declaration that you will not cave in to the sinful will of the government, 
This will give you something to be accountable for. Because there's pressure that's coming to some people that you have never felt before. There's, there are times that are heading this way. If we live just a little longer, we're going to see something change in this country that we have not seen before. It's going to happen. You see, this is a factual concept that, that is totally alien and unfamiliar to pulpits and sermons. and, and that, 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 you, know, to, that, you don't hear these kind of things coming across pulpits and enlightening and educating the Western Americanized Christianity that, you, that, that, that we have here. But, but I'm here to tell you that now is the time to define our stance as a church and I don't mean where we stand on issues. I mean to find our stance and we will not back down. We will stand to the death that we're not afraid. God called us to be soldiers, men. We need to define our stance as a church and as a people of God that will, will not give in or submit to the Antichrist spirit that we feel changing to everything that's around us right now. Like the Bible says, not loving our lives even to the death. On this note, I want to share something interesting with you that I found that I've never heard anybody talk about before. Some of you may have heard this, spoke about, taught on, but I've never heard anybody talk about this before that I'm going to share with you today. And uh, some of it's common sense if you think about it, and some of it just kind of jumped out at me, and I had a, a one of those revelations in the entire thing. But, but, but if you've ever done any studying on early church history, you already understand that during the first 500 years of the church, there were many followers of Christ who were persecuted, imprisoned, and even put to death for not denying their faith. First 500 years, it was like that. And, and, and after doing some studying, I came to discover that during the first five centuries of Christianity, it has been found that drowning was commonly used as a means of executing Christians. Many times when uh, there was a, a large group to be executed, like a large group that would not deny their faith, it, 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 it would be done by suffocation using a body of water. And drowning, uh, when used as an execution, would be the act of someone putting another person underwater until there was no life left in that person. They would breathe their final breath just before they were put underwater, and then they would not come back from that, that water. That person would die there. Drowning can be actually one of the more violent choices of, 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 uh, of a way to, be, to die. And during the drowning process, for the first several seconds after water is inhaled, the drowning person is said is, is, is there to be in a state of fight or flight as they struggle to breathe. And, and as the, the airway begins to close to prevent more water from getting into the lungs, the person will start to hold their breath involuntarily. This takes place for up to two minutes until they lose consciousness. Then the person becomes unconscious. And during this stage, they can be, be revived through resusc resuscitation and have a good chance uh, of having a good outcome. But, but during this process, breathing will finally stop, and then the heart slows. This can last for several minutes. And then, then the body enters into a state of hypoxic convulsion. This physical state can have the appearance of someone having a seizure. Without oxygen, the person's body appears to turn blue and may jerk around erratically. The brain, heart, and lungs reach a state beyond where they can be revived. And the final stage of drowning is called cerebral hypoxia, followed by a clinical death. No wonder this method was chosen as a form of execution because of the torture that was associated with it in this process. And this is where it got interesting. Bible scholars say that baptism and martyrdom, that's dying for what you believe, are very closely and intimately connected. As a Jesus-following church, we have trained our minds and our eyes to observe and receive the act of baptism as someone's conscious decision to follow Christ. And it, it just kind of ends there with many of us. And although our view of this action of outward profession is not incorrect, it does not uh, completely take on the, the, the weightiness and bear the gravity that it should because many do not understand its origins nor the ancient view that was held by the early church. So, so pretend with me just for a moment that you were totally ignorant of the gospel and the plan of salvation and you were to walk up, just walk up on an individual who was pushing another individual underwater. How would, you, how, would you, how would you allow that act to register in your mind if you saw this taking place initially? I mean, if you walked up and you saw one, saw somebody pushing somebody else under the water, well, 
Obviously, in our minds, it would appear that the person was being drowned by another person. See, Bible scholars have, are, have determined that baptism and martyrdom are very closely connected. During, they were very closely connected during the first five centuries of the early church. During those times, the act of baptism was emblematic of being violently put to death by the hands of a persecutor. Matthew 20, this is the way they thought for 500 years if you got baptized. Matthew 20 and 22 says this. Jesus answered and said, are you able to drink the cup that I drink of? means can you go through the sufferings that I'm going to go through. And then he says to them, he said, we, they said, we are able. And then he said to them, he said, you shall indeed drink my, of my cup. And, and, and then it says, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, meaning that they would too also die for what they stood for. Luke 12 and 50 says, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how I am, am I straightened till it be accomplished? Meaning that a violent death was waiting for the salvation of men. One commentator said it like this. He said, as so many of the primitive followers of Christ sealed the truth with their blood, every man who took on him the profession of Christianity, which was done by receiving baptism, considered himself as exposing his life to the most imminent hazard when he was being baptized and offering his life with those who had already offered and laid down theirs. He was therefore baptized in reference to this martyrdom and having a regard to those dead, he cheerfully received baptism that whether he were taken off by a natural or violent death, he might be raised in the likeness of Jesus Christ's resurrection and that of the illustrious martyrs. So there is a, a, a reason that baptism has been referred to as a water grave. More reason than we realize Paul said that we were buried with Jesus when we are baptism. Baptism is not a bathtub full of water where you go get clean in it. It's a graveyard where sinful men die and get buried. Uh, originally, it was the expression of a believer who was professing that they were willing to die for their belief in Jesus and, and, and what he accomplished for us. It is expression of the idea that if you should die, that you'll be resurrected in Christ. It's a declaration that you're not afraid to die in this life because you believe that you will be resurrected to eternal life. Or as the scripture says, not loving this life unto death. The very act of baptism symbolizes your belief in the resurrection because of the death that you are willing to take on. If baptism does not become a grave to bury the sinful dead man, then resurrection power will not follow. There has to be something that, is die, that dies and is buried right there. There's something that takes place in your heart before you walk into there that you know that when you come out of there, that person that went in there is dying. He's dead. And before resurrection power, that's the power that brings something back to life. It can take place. There has to be death. Resurrection power doesn't work in something that's not dead yet. You can't raise something that's still alive. It's still alive. It has to die. It can only follow where death has taken place. So when we come to understand what was really happening during the act of baptism in the, in the same manner that was understood by the early church, no wonder many would come out of the water and be filled with the Holy Ghost. No wonder. So many as they came out of the water. You find this in Acts chapter 19 with, with the disciples of, of John the Baptist when Paul came to the coast of Ephesus. They, they were all there and they'd never heard of it before. The Bible says when they came out of the water, they were filled with the Spirit. So it's important that we understand what is really happening when we are put under water. You are being put under water by the hands of another individual who is symbolizing the role of a persecutor who is drowning you. That's the way they looked at it. When you stood in that, in, in that, in that tub of water, I kid you not, I think I want to get baptized again. It, it just, it has, it has consumed my mind because if there is ever a day and a time that we need to be willing to say, I will take it to the line. I will not back down. I will die for this. I will stand on the truth until the, the, the life flows out of me, until I am dead. I will preach the gospel. I'm not going to back up. But 
in case you haven't wondered or, or, or been wondering, the enemy is very abrasive too. All you hear screaming and yelling all over our country are activists that are screaming and yelling for rights that stand for sinfulness. While the church sits by quietly. This declaration that you value the life that the Lord has purchased for you to be, to be greater than the mortal life that you're living. This, this is where death to the old man will take place. I, I hope you're, just, you're grasping what I'm saying. If, if you are embracing the essence of this, as I did, I hope that maybe somebody here this morning I had I told the church Wednesday night I had something I I wanted to to share with everybody today. That uh, uh, I I really felt like that somebody would want to be get baptized, maybe even rebaptized. I don't know because of the way it's impacted me. And I was like, man, I just really stepped out there saying that, but it's strange. I I I went to go get a haircut the other day, and uh, went in that place, the same place I go into, and. uh, I have never asked them to do this. They always call me Brother Dan. And so, like, I, I promise you, I, don't, I, I took forever for him to tell them I was a preacher. I don't walk around telling people stuff like that. But so I was sitting there getting a haircut, and, and this, this lady that's there, she's, she's struggled with some things in the past, and, and she's, uh, she's had lots of you know, problems she's dealt with from the past, and she's come out of those things and really trying to do good with her life. And, 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 uh, and so she... she um, she, she, she said, Brother Dan, I have some things I want to talk to you about whenever uh, you get a chance. And, uh, and I said, okay. She said, I'll just tell you. She said, you know, when I was a child, I was, I was baptized as a Catholic. She said, but, but, but now I, I, I want to get baptized. I said, well, I want to do it. And, and, I, and I'm thinking, God, there it is right there. We do have some people in America, in the world right now, who are still ready to commit their life to you wholeheartedly and give everything they've got to you and sell out everything to you and give up that old person. So I hope that somebody here today uh, is, 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 is ready to, to, to stand up for what you believe. If you'd stand with me right now. For a long time, many of us have lived a pretty easy life here on American soil. And for a long time, we have enjoyed a land of plenty and safety that for so long seemed to hold promise for the future of our posterity. And for so long, many of us have been living for the Lord, been living for the Lord under these blessed conditions. We've been living for the Lord but, but now, since promises have been broken and safety is shrinking and, and plenty is declining, we, we can all see in plain view that something is coming. I'm not sure what it's going to be, but it's not going to look anything like it did probably two decades ago around here anymore. And so, so I stand here today knowing that so many are willing to live for the Lord. But, but I have come to simply ask you this question. Are you willing to die for the Lord? Where are you going to draw the line at? What, what, what is going to be the thing that you decide, well, I just can't go that far. I, you know, God, hope you have mercy on me. Where are you going to draw the line at? Have you thought about that? When you get pushed in the corner, where will you draw the line as far as what you stand? Will, will, you, will you give into the demands of the enemy to ensure your survival? You know, we, are naturally, we naturally want to live. We have this desire to live. And, and, and that can be a very, very powerful thing that works. I've seen people on their deathbed that just, I mean, life support and everything. Just with that death rattle. I know that uh, we have people that are in respiratory therapy in this place right now that have heard that many, many times. And they'll do that for days because there's something in their body that makes them want to live. We had this innate desire to want to live. And if we get pushed back in the corner hard enough where we see our life being threatened, sometimes we'll make decisions that aren't the best. We need to make up our minds today what kind of decision. Your children, my God, your children need to see you making your mind up. What kind of example are you going to set for your kid today? Are you going to stand it for what's right? If I make a call, so will you be willing to die for, 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 for what you believe today? Will you step out from where you're at today? Or will you hide behind a pew and just hope nobody notices? You see, I'm just like that. I'll put you on the spot because I'll tell you right now, I'll wave my hand high. 
say, yes, I'm, I'm that guy. I'm going to take it to the line. You hear me? Mark my words. Be my witness today. If I'm, I'm going to be that guy that will stand and toe the line until they cut my throat, until they push me back. I will live for God and I'll stand for the truth and I will not back away. And so will he. I promise you because I know him. But what are you going to do? What you going to do with what you have? What does it mean to you? How far will it go? What does it mean to you what you have? Or do you have really what you need? What, what, what you have right now, what does it mean to you? Where you draw them? What, when they pull your child out or, your, or somebody that's kin to you out, what you going to do? You're going to wait till then to make a decision? You need to make a decision now. You need to have those talks with your family now. What you're going to do? You need to know how far you will go with this. It needs to be the air that you breathe. It needs to be the, 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 the thing that consumes your thoughts is eternity. It needs to be what matters right now. Dad and mom, your children are watching your decision today. Their salvation may depend on your stance. You know they watch what you do, don't you? You know that, don't you? They watch what you do. They're watching you. The way you act, the way you look, the way you dress, the way you talk. They watch you. Everything you do justifies. The things that you do justifies. Absolutely. That's right. It's true. You know what? Even when they're grown. My sons, I have two grown sons. And one that that's, looks grown. They watch everything that I do. When I do something, and, I, and sometimes I do stuff that ain't always the best, then they'll do it. I'm thinking, don't do that. Do as I, do as I say, not as I do. We do that sometimes. But see, this is not one of those times. This is one of them times where I want to see Jack Payne and Eddie Stansberry, and I want to see men like that, 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 that you know what, that knows what it's like to go toe-to-toe with the devil and, and, and Wayne McKnight. I, I want to see men like that step out and say, look, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I want to see some old shoe leather hit the floor and say, I'm going to be that guy that's going to stand in the face of the enemy. I want to see some, some men and some fathers that will step out. Come on, is there somebody here today that will just step out from where you're at and make an open declaration that you're going to stand up for what you believe. You're willing to die. I want your children to know where you stand today. Hallelujah. Minister, teacher, leader, the actions that you take today, they're going to preach a message to those that you're connected with. The actions that you make today are preaching a message. They're letting your family know. They're letting your students know. They're letting the people around you, your constituents, your friends know where you stand. Are you embarrassed of God today? Come on, is there somebody else? I'm not, a, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of it. It's the power of God and the salvation. I asked God this morning, I said, Lord, I don't want to operate in any other spirit today. I don't want any human spirit to operate in me. I want, I want his spirit today operating only because it's the only one that will render what needs to take place today. God, I'm off. You old soldiers of the cross. We got some old soldiers in here that's been in this for a long, long time. Most of us... Y'all got the Holy Ghost when I was in, in 1983. I don't even remember 1983 hardly. I've, I've been in around this all of my life, all of my known life that I can remember. And I don't, I don't ever remember seeing times anything remotely like what we're living in right now. It's a really good time to really know God. I mean know Him, and it's a really good time for Him to know you. We claim to know him so much, but you know what? We need to make sure that he knows us. I don't want him looking at me and says, I don't know who you are. I see your faces today. God sees you today. It means you're standing up for what you believe. You're standing up saying today that I am willing to die for what I believe. If it's not worth it to you, it won't be worth it to some of those people that are watching you. This is exactly what I expected today to be like. 
Raise your hands right now in this place. In the name of Jesus. I'm just going to pray right now over this congregation. Father, Lord, only you know, God, what awaits us in the future from this day forward. Lord, only you know what we'll go through. Only you, mighty God, only you have the plan. Only you know for sure the things that we'll deal with. God, we just see some things coming that don't look right. God, there are things that are, that are moving forward and escalating in this world, Lord Jesus, that, that's changing everything around us. And God, we want to stand strong. Lord, God, you see the leadership in our church, oh Lord. Lord, from the top to the bottom. God, give us, Lord, what we need in this last hour. Father, Lord, you called us to this. Lord, you called us in this hour. And Lord, I know that if you called us in this hour, then God, you can give us what we need to make it through this hour. Lord, you anointed us in this hour. Almighty God, and I know, Lord, you can give us what we need in this hour, Lord, to make it through what is ahead of us, God. You would not have called us to something, God, Lord, that we could not make it through. Lord, you would not allow us to be alive in this hour, Lord God, if you did not know that we could make it through it. So, Lord, I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, reach down and touch this congregation of people today. Lord, I pray that your spirit fall upon them in a mighty way. Lord, let there be a deep, deeper commitment and deeper desire, Lord. Lord, that would well up inside of them, Lord. Lord Jesus, mighty God, I pray this morning, Lord. Lord, I pray from the top of our head to the soles of our feet, God. Let there be a renewal, Lord Jesus, a rebaptism of your spirit. Lord, a fresh commitment. Lord, a new desire, God. Lord, not last. Pastures anointing, Lord, but an anointing for this hour, an anointing, Lord, for this season, this time, in the name of Jesus. Somebody lift up the name of Jesus right now. Somebody shout with a shout of victory right now. Somebody do that just a little louder. Just a little louder. Let the devil know where you stand right now. Let hell know that we are not backing down. Somebody let the enemy know right now that you're not backing up. Come on, there's liberty in this place. There's healing in this house right now. There's deliverance in this place right now in the name of Jesus. If you need something from the Lord, I want you to quickly move right here to the center. The presence of the Lord is here right now. Quickly, if, if you need something from God, come over to the center. We want to pray for you this morning. If you need something in your life, in your family, if you have a situation of some kind, we want to pray for you this morning before you leave. The Spirit of the Lord is here and is moving right now. Mighty God, in the name of